of that. But I think we're moving into a place again where we can, in many of our lives, relaunch and restart in the same way, just as a church we are, a fresh, clean slate, a, a new beginning. And my prayer for those of us who need that, because I know some of us are sitting here and we need 2022 to be a new beginning. That looking back over last year, over the last years, kind of the one thing that you've been praying is, God, can I just start again? And I have a sense that God is doing that, obviously with us as a church, but with many of us as individuals. And I believe in a corporate context for us as a church, there's a, a new start for us to press into the Lord in a new way in the coming years and the coming months. To, again, just a little bit like we heard this morning, to actually believe in the prophetic, to practice the prophetic. The prophetic is not only people coming forward and sharing, but I was just reminded as I was reading in this week of Jeremiah, and God says to him, go and buy a field. And he's like, God, why must I buy this property when I know, God, you've spoken to me, we're about to be invaded by foreigners. And God says, no, but go and buy the field anyway. And he goes, and he goes and buys the field just before they're invaded. And he says, the reason I'm buying this is because it's a prophetic declaration. God is saying there will again be buying of land in this country. And for a season, it won't be. And that's the prophetic. And I believe God is leading us again in the prophetic. And he's going to show us what it means to live prophetic lives that the Spirit of the Lord still speaks today that He still leads us, that He still guides us. And in a sense, as I mentioned, that He works in seasons. I still believe in God's promises. I know many of us sitting here, we have beautiful, precious promises that God has given us that maybe you've written down in a journal somewhere. If you're here this morning and you don't have promises that you know God has given you as a person, as an individual, we would love to pray with you after the service to trust that God would begin to give you those promises. And I sense for some of us and many of us this year, God is going to begin to release us into a measure of those promises. We know that His promises will be completed one day in heaven, in eternity. As much as we would love His promises to be completed here in the earth, they will never come to complete fulfillment here on this broken earth. But there will be glimpses of it. There will be measures of it. There will be, in a sense, a, a promised land, even if we know the eternal promised land is so different to anything on this earth. And as we head into this year, sort of towards the end of last year, I just sense three words, three things specifically that God has just laid on my heart for this year. And I spoke about them in various sermons. And the first one is joy. I believe God is wanting for many of us to restore our joy. You know, one of the things that I love about kids, small, small kids, all of them are filled with joy. I'm yet to meet a two-year-old, and there are moments when they're not filled with joy. I'm a parent, I know this, and all of the parents have been there. There are moments when they're not filled with joy, but there's just a joy that comes so naturally in little kids. And as we grow up, many of us, we lose an element of that childlike joy and I believe God is wanting to restore joy in some of our lives, hope. On Christmas Day, I know many of you weren't here, and I don't think we've been able to upload the sermon as yet on our YouTube and on our podcast, but I, I spoke about joy, and I just want to at least leave us with this one verse before we carry on with today's message. It's Romans chapter 15, verse 13, and it's sort of a prayer that we prayed on, on our Christmas Day service. It's not on the slides, unfortunately, but I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so joy and hope, that God would restore those to us in a beautiful portion. And the third one is, it's not one word, it's one thought though, His presence. That word that Brown brought about the burden that's destroyed by the anointing. It speaks about the presence of the living God, the closeness of God. I, I love the fact, one of the reasons that I, I love this building is because it's pretty amazingly built, I think. <laughs> you know, speaking to guys in, in the week. You know, a building like this, with these wooden beams and stuff, just I don't think anybody would dream of 
building like this anymore in today because it would just be so expensive. But it wasn't exactly cheap 60 years ago when they built this either. It's not like people came together and thought, hey, we need a place to meet for our church. Let's just throw something together. There was immense sacrifice financially and otherwise and skill and giftedness that goes into putting a building like this together. And, you know, we get to step into that. And I thank God that 60 years ago there were people who were willing to make sacrifices for the kingdom. And they had no idea that we would be here today. But we get to be here today because of what they did 60 years ago. But I also love a bunch of other things. I love about this building that we once again got space to minister. The bike shop almost didn't have that because, you know, the fellowship area was there. We wanted to pray. And it's just awkward sometimes praying, getting personal when people are around. And here we have plenty of space, not only to dance with a band, but to come forward for, to receive prayer, to receive ministry, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our midst. And, you know, I've always wondered buildings like this, you know, what do you call a space like this? And I've come to love the old English word, which many churches do use. Sort of the modern word is auditorium, but I love the word a sanctuary, a holy place. That this for us would be a sanctuary we, where we meet with God. There's plenty of other places where we also meet and we have a whole bunch of fun here on this premises. And we're going to have a whole bunch of fun in here as well. But this is a sanctuary, a, a place that is set aside for the presence of God. And I believe one of the reasons why I'm excited and one of the reasons why I believe God's brought us here is to give us a place again where we can celebrate His presence. And His presence is with us where two or three are together. His presence is with us when we are out cycling and we're having a brine, we're having fun. His presence is with us. He promised us His presence would be with us always, even to the end of the age. But His presence is with us a little bit different in spaces like this. Not better, not more, not less, but different. And we get to celebrate His presence. So I want to hold that before us. This year, I believe that these three things God is really wanting to bring us back to as a church. To joy, to hope, and to His presence. I want us to turn to the book of Genesis and look at a Bible story which many of us probably know really well and we've Looked at from different angles, I'm guessing, over the years from Children's Church. I'm pretty sure in Children's Church they've read this story a number of times. But there's just sort of one glimpse in here that I want us for a moment to think about and to stand still around. I think it's Genesis chapter 18, reading from the New Living Translation. The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak tree or the oak grove belonging to Mamre. And just quick background here for those who are not familiar completely with the story. There's a man whose name was Abram, and I love God's interaction with Abram because it was completely God-initiated. Abram never did anything to draw near to God. One day, God just decided, I like this Abram guy. And he kind of, in a sense, came and knocked on, I don't know how you knock on the door of a tent, but kind of pulled his tent pegs out, something, did something to get Abram's attention in the tent. He gave him these great promises. He changed his name and he said, Abram, your name is no longer Abram. Your name will be Abraham because you will become the father of many nations. And that change in name brought a change in identity, a change in destiny. And many scholars even say the really interesting part about it is the change was the middle letter of Jehovah's name. So God took of his name and put it into Abram's name. And Abram became Abraham. And so they've had a couple of interaction. These great promises have, God has already given Abraham. And that's why we see here that the Lord appeared again. It's not the first time. To Abraham. Near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. And one day Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent. At the hottest part of the day. He looked up and he noticed three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran to meet them. And welcomed them bowing low to the ground. And we see sort of from verse 1 here, it's the Lord. One of these three men is Jesus himself. And theologians are sort of not exactly too sure who the other two are. But if you read the, next, the rest of the story, it seems like it was two angels, two of the archangels in a sense who accompanied Jesus. We call this a theophany when the Holy Spirit, like when Jesus appears in personal form in the Old Testament. So here we have Jesus appearing to Abraham. And Abraham recognizes me. He says, my Lord, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. 
Rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your journey. And you know, when I was reading this and just preparing, I don't think we understand what it means to quickly prepare a meal for visitors. We think, let me phone Uber Eats and they're going to deliver something for you. Or maybe there's something in the fridge. There's no refrigerator. There is no Uber Eats. They say quickly, and I think quickly means it's kind of breakfast time now, but we'll have something ready by dinner. Because, all right, they said, do as you have said. So Abraham ran back to the tent and said to Sarah, that's his wife, hurry, get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough, bake some bread. Anyone who's baked bread knows that's not a quick 10-minute process. Then Abraham ran out to the herd, and he chose a tender calf, and he gave it to his servant who quickly prepared it. I think quickly for them and quickly for us are different words. You know, quickly at McDonald's and quickly for Abraham, they don't quite line up. And so when the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk and the roasted meat, and he served it to the men. As they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the trees. Where is Sarah, your wife? The visitors asked. She's inside the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you. And I'm assuming this is Jesus speaking in this context. I will return to you about this time next year. And your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Jesus has already given Abraham promises that he will have a son. There's already been Abraham taking matters into his own hand with Sarah's servant, Hagar, and the outfall of all of that. There's been about 20 years since God has promised he's got a son. And here he says, next year. Suddenly, he stepped into the season where now it's actually happening. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. I don't know if I'm allowed saying if that's a lady's thing, you know, listening eavesdropping there a little bit. She's making sure she's not missing part of the conversation. But Abraham and Sarah both were very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. The more sort of word-for-word translations, they'd say that she was, the way of the woman had ceased to be with Sarah. She was way past menopause. It wasn't in the natural possible for to have her kids anymore. So she laughed silently to herself, and she said, How could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also so old? He was about 100. I think she was about 90. And then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I'll return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And the bit that I want us to pause at just a little bit as we launch off into 2022 is, is anything too hard for the Lord? It's an echo, it's a sort of a question that's echoed in, in Jeremiah verse, um, chapter 32. He, first he prays and he prays and he says, God, nothing is too hard to you and for you. And then he prays about some stuff and then God answers back and says, nothing is too hard for me. Is, well, God actually asks, is anything too hard for me? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And so my question of faith this morning that I want to hold before us, as you look towards 2022, what is it that is stirring in your heart that is too hard for the Lord? I'm trusting God that He's going to remind us that He is a God of miracles. Saw some miracles this week. Edna and Vainant both got married, not to each other, two separate weddings and It's a miracle, not as a slight on any of their characters, but because every single time two people come together in marriage, that is a miracle. That God would bring two people just in a modern world that we live in today. We in a Christian community still, we think it's normal. But for the world out there, it is still so foreign, the idea that I'm going to lay down my life for one person for the rest of my life. And every time with the young or slightly older people like Vainan, I said to him yesterday, I think he said it as well, kind of, there was a day we thought that day was never going to come, but it did come yesterday, and he is now a married man. Um, 
Those are miracles every time. You know, some of us are sitting here, perhaps like Vainant. Vainant isn't old by any stretch of the imagination, but he's older than most of us sitting here who are married were when we got married. And perhaps you're sitting here and you feel a little bit like Vainant. God, that is never going to happen. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Perhaps as parents, you're struggling with children, either conceiving or something just around the children, raising the children, children's health. Maybe something in a career, maybe something in a relationship, something in your family. God, this thing is, if I'm totally honest, this is just a little bit too hard for you. God, it's hard for me saying it aloud because I, I know it's not too hard for you. But in my heart, I've come to believe it's too hard for you. Is anything too hard for you? Last year, we spoke a lot about faith. We did a whole series on Nehemiah and how faith without works is dead. The accompanying works, and it's so important. But you know, at the key of faith, as much as our, our works are important, but the central part of our faith is that it's not about our works, it's about Christ's works. That our accompanying faith, our works accompanying our faith are not irrelevant, they are important, they demonstrate our faith. But our faith isn't in my ability, in Nehemiah's context, to rebuild the wall. Our faith isn't in my ability to have a healthy marriage. My faith isn't in my ability to be a good parent or for me a good pastor, for you a good engineer or a teacher or whatever it may be. No, my faith is in God's ability to allow me to be that, to make me that, to breathe His capacity over me. And so last year we spent a lot about faith, and I think this year God wants us to step out in that faith. Towards the end of last year, I, I spoke a message. I asked most of our leaders to listen to that, if possible, about two different prayers that I really believe God wants us to pray as we seek, and head, seek His face and head into 2022. The first one is about His kingdom coming. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. God, what does that look like in my life for your kingdom to come? Not only on Sunday when I come to church, but Monday when I wake up, what does it look like, God, for your kingdom to come and your will be to, done here in my sphere as it is in heaven? What does that look like? And that takes faith. God, my company, God, when we stand around the coffee cooler, those are not faith-based conversations, Lord. God, when I arrive at work and my boss greets me, Lord, I'm intimidated by that every time, God, I, it is so far removed to even begin to consider, Lord, about your kingdom here because for me it's just a struggle to survive there. And I believe God's wanting to stir a little bit of faith to say, let your kingdom come. Obviously, there's an element of that that will have a church component to it, but that is not the sole way in which the kingdom of God is advanced. And then the second one is to pray the Lord of the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, Jesus said to us. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the field and for us to pray that, to pray, God, would you raise up harvesters? And as we're praying that also to realize, am I willing to be an answer to my own prayer? God, I can't sit on my couch all day watching rugby and praying that you would send out harvesters and not be willing to be a harvester myself. And if you missed that message, I want to invite you perhaps to listen to that. But what are the things in your life that only God can do? What are the dreams and the hopes for 2022 that only God can do? And perhaps maybe there's something inside of me says, but maybe this is just a little bit too hard for God. And hopefully today our, our faith can rise just a bit. And this year as we potentially can be overwhelmed by our challenges, our hopes, our dreams, just you know, moving in this building, it's, it's beautiful and it's precious, but at times I just feel so overwhelmed sitting with the kind of the consultants and the installers and kind of the stuff we need to do here and the price tags attached to all of that. And, you know, part of me is just like, God, how do we do this? God, how do we make disciples? Lord, how do we reach the community? God, how do we reach in one way students who are not even on a campus at the moment and haven't been for two years? And God, how do we reach families who have these massive high walls around all of their homes, and it's, you know, the only guy who gets in there is the take-a-lot delivery van. These massive walls to protect and to keep the outside out, but it's so broken on the inside. God, how do we reach them, God? 
And one can feel overwhelmed by all of those different things and all of those different challenges. And I know all of us sitting here in our world, in your space, in your environment, in your context, there are things that can overwhelm us. Things that can seem impossible. Things that God, there just doesn't seem to be an answer to this. I literally said that kind of this week just when some of the quotes and the stuff came through. And I was like, God, there doesn't seem to be an answer to this. God, if I have to figure this out, it's not going to happen. But God, but God, is anything too hard for me? Is anything too hard for me? And so this year, kind of as I was just working through that, instead of being overwhelmed as we can so easily be by our challenges, even overwhelmed by our hopes, overwhelmed by the dreams that we have in our hearts, I realized Let us focus on the one who can make it possible, the one for whom it is not too hard. So I want to read from, actually, David read a a part of the passage that we're going to read together now, just confirmation that God just wants us to look to Him. Because sometimes even in, in my faith, I find myself kind of wanting faith for the thing and, you know, wondering about the situation or this relationship and and sort of losing focus and beginning to think faith is about the event, or faith is about the result, or faith is about the stuff that needs to happen in the work and the building. And then the Holy Spirit is just so faithful to remind us that faith is about a person. And that as we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher, the completer, the perfecter of our faith, that as we look to Jesus, the challenge suddenly becomes not the challenge, it comes about Jesus. And we can ask the question that God asks Abraham here, is anything too hard for the Lord? And if we have a small view of God, then yes, some things are too hard for the Lord. If we have a big view of God, then less things in our mind at least are too hard for the Lord. And so this year, I want to invite us to trust God to increase our view of Him. I love this building because, as I mentioned just now, it's so beautiful, but I love buildings like this who just say something that God is big and God is, He's not an ordinary God. I think it was John who in the week sent a photo of the building as we were prepping, and he was like, that's awesome. Really, I am in awe, not of what we did here, but of what God has established here, a building which helps us just realize that God is above our day-to-day lives. And so I want us to read this passage with that as sort of a, a little bit of a background. That yes, there are dreams, there are challenges. Yes, we want faith to be stirred, but faith is stirred by just having a revelation of Jesus. I want us to read from Revelation chapter 4. Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. This is the apostle John. He is writing this whole book. And sometimes we miss this. There's So much to be gleaned from the book of Revelation. But all of that is found within the context of the title of the book. Because the title of the book is not the revelation of what needs to happen, the revelation of the future, the revelation of the apocalypse, the revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the whole book primarily has at its heart to show us who Jesus is. It also shows us prophetically signs and times and all of those things. Those things are also included in the book, but they are secondary to bringing a revelation of Jesus. So John, as he looks, he sees a door standing open in heaven. and The same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones like Jasper and Carnelian, and the glow of the emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. One of the things that we struggle with as humans is to describe God. You see, we use the word, I used the word awesome just now. The cricket was awesome, the chair is awesome, my lunch is awesome, my friend is awesome, the book was awesome, God is awesome. And what happens is our our woordeskat, Literally, I've just my voice got thumb and I hit the Our vocabulary fails us. 
our vocabulary doesn't allow us to declare and describe who God is. The only things that we have reference for are human things. And so, in a sense, John is bound by that human limitation. He's describing here God the Father sitting on a throne. And he describes him based on the most glorious gemstones that he has a reference for. It's not like God looked like stone. It was, if I have to describe something as glorious, as beautiful, as perfection, then the best human reference that I have are these gemstones. And so he says he looks like jasper and chameleon, and there's this glow like an emerald all around him. It circles his throne like a rainbow. And I'm pretty convinced that we're in heaven. It's not going to look anything like those stones, but we're going to see, I, I get why he called it those stones, because what else do we use within our human terminology to relate to? God is other and He's so different and everything about Him. We don't have a single word that can describe who God is because every single word we have, we find reference to in human nature. Every single word that we can think of is based on our understanding of something here on this earth. And every single one of those things falls short of a description of God. And so 24 thrones surrounded Him and 24 elders sat on Him. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. I love that here in Pretoria, we've got a reference for that. We've got a reference for just flashes of lightning and just these thunderbolts that just strike right next to your house and the whole earth shakes. And when God speaks, a little bit of that happens. And in front of the throne were seven torches with seven building burning flames, and this is the sevenfold Spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion, and you know, one can spend weeks just unpacking all of this, but I want us just to focus on this one specific element. Like a lion, the second like an ox, the third had a human face, the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out, day after day, and night after night. They keep on saying, holy, 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 the song of heaven we just sang earlier, is the Lord God Almighty, the one who was and who is and who is to come. There's this perpetual worship. You know, some of us still struggle with engaging in worship here on earth in a musical type. I want to say it's a good practice for what's going to happen for a pretty long time in eternity. We can try and break away from that, except the entire book of Revelation repeatedly shows us that there's going to be worship in the form of music. And just a moment, we're going to see now it's going to be pretty loud. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, they fall down and they worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. And here we've had this description of the Father on the throne. This whole of chapter 4 is all about God and the angels worshiping and the elders casting down their crown. And then you saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. And this is the bit that I want us just to focus on for a little bit this morning. That there's God the Father who has a scroll, a message for you. Yes, in this context, it's a message for the church. It's a broad message. But I believe that as we come to know God the Father, we discover a God who has a message for us, who has a purpose for us, who has a plan for us, who has a way for us. And the scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne, there was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. So we see the scroll is writing on and most people believe that sort of allusion to Roman scrolls of the day, which would have had the content on the inside, sort of all of the detail, and the outside would have been a summary of what the scroll contains. So he looks at the scroll, 
and something stirs in his heart, which is probably stirring and would be in your heart and in my heart, I want to read that scroll. I want to know what it is that God has written for us. I want to know what is His plan. I want to know what His purpose is. I want to have His ways released upon our lives. And so there's this desire in John, as there should be, to know the things of God. I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on the scroll and to open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, I'd hate to know who that is, was able to open the scroll and to read it. And you know the reality? That there are large parts of our lives, and if we don't know Jesus, every part of our life is exactly stuck here. That there is a scroll that God has written for us, that God has prepared for us, but there is not one found who is worthy to open it. That we cannot open the purposes of God over our lives. We cannot open the dreams of God over our lives. We cannot open the words of God over our lives. We cannot open that which God has prepared, which He has in store, which He has written for you and for me. We cannot open it. And then we do exactly what John does. Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and to read it. No one was found worthy. We were a little bit like Abraham was. Where there's the scroll with this message, or Sarah in the context we read now, there's a scroll with a message and there's the laugh because there isn't actually someone who is able to do it. There isn't someone who is able to perform it. This word, it's locked up, it's written there, but it's sealed and there's nobody who can open the seal of God's purposes over my lives. But, I think that might be my very favorite word in all of Scripture, but. It is amazing how often in Scripture there is no hope. We've come to the end. We're going to be annihilated. We don't know which direction to go. It is pointless. We can give up. Game over. But, and that's where the angel finds himself here. This is where John finds himself here. There is nobody in all of creation, under the earth, in the earth, in heaven. There is nobody who can open the scroll of that which God has prepared for us. And he weeps bitterly because of that. But, but one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open its scroll, to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. Not the most glorious sight probably we've ever seen. Very glorious in the sense of glorious because it's full of glory of God, but not glorious as what we would imagine to be glorious in a human sense. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered, but it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings, and among the 24 elders, he had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and he took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. Jesus wants to come and step into your life and take the scroll of the Father if we will just let him. You know, some of us, we are so stuck on the scroll. We've got the scroll and we're weeping because no one is able to open the scroll. And whether it is a scroll over our family or a scroll over my child or a scroll over my marriage or my future marriage or my career, we're holding on to this thing. And right now, Jesus is standing there and he's just, give me the scroll. I am worthy. Just give me the scroll. Stop opening, trying to open it yourself. Stop trying to Google someone who can open it. Stop trying to knock on doors, trying to pay someone to open it. Nobody is worthy to open the scroll. But I am. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and they had 
gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words, you are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God. And they will reign on the earth. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and of the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus. And can I just quickly stop there quickly? Thousands and millions of angels all around singing in a mighty chorus. They're not whispering. This is loud. Just now we heard an angel speaking with a loud voice and it sounded to John like thunder. One angel. Here we have millions of them. A different passage speaks about 10,000 times 10,000. Last time I did mathematics, that was 100 million singing to the Lord with a loud voice. There is something about musical worship which is going to just resonate all across heaven. And we get to have a glimpse of it here on this earth. And they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. And they sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the Lamb. I'm going to ask the band to come up again. And if we can do that hymn of heaven again, please. And as we do that, I believe God is wanting this to stir faith in our hearts that He is worthy to open the scroll. That He is worthy to release the purposes and the plans of the Father into our lives. That too many of us, I'm not saying don't get an education. I'm not saying don't study. I'm not saying don't grow in human skill and human ability. But don't put our faith in our ability to achieve, to become, to accomplish. Whether it's as a parent, whether it's in a career, whatever it is. Put our faith in the one who is able to open the scroll. For some of us this morning, you need to hear that there is a scroll. There is a scroll with your name on it. There is a scroll that God the Father has prepared that has your name, your full names. Married Weinand yesterday. Weinand, Christoffel, Hendrik, Furi. Every single name, even the name that you don't even know God has given you is written on that scroll. We miss sometimes that Bible says in heaven, we're going to receive a new name. There's a word that we saw with Abram here. God comes to Abram and says, I know people call you Abram, but I call you Abraham. Solomon was one of those people. God called Solomon by a different name. God called him Jedediah, the beloved of the Lord. Everybody else called him Solomon. God said Jedediah. Simon, this man who gets just swayed by every opinion, just he's a people pleaser, just going this way, going that way, just like a reed blown around in the wind, and his name is Simon, it means reed. And Jesus looks at him and says, everybody else calls you Simon, I'm not going to call you reed, I'm going to call you rock. Because you're going to build your house on the rock and you will not be shaken. And over your life here today, there is a scroll with your name written on it. And there is only one who is worthy to open that scroll. There is a scroll with 2022 written on it. There is a scroll with purposes and with plans for that new career, for that new relationship, for that child that you trust in God for. There is a scroll written. But He is worthy and no one else. And we can make like John, that's the natural reaction, just turn to ourselves and begin to weep because no one is found who is worthy. Or we can listen to the elder. He tells John, stop weeping. Because there is one. The lion of the tribe of Judah. 
He has prevailed. So can we stand together? I want to pray for us. And then we're going to just sing the song again. And I want you to sing it over your life, to sing it as in a sense as an invitation that he who is worthy would come and take your scroll. In just a moment, we're going to pray with some individuals as well. If you're here this morning and you've never in any way invited Jesus to step into your life, to take your scroll, to say, Jesus, this whole life of mine, I'm going to trust you with it. We would love to pray with you. If you're standing here today and you say, Philip, I don't know that I've got a relationship with Jesus. We would love to pray with you. And then there's some of us here this morning and you're just like, I need Jesus to open the scroll. If I'm honest, this morning, yesterday, last week, last month, when I thought about it, I laughed a little bit like Sarah. I didn't know it was possible. I didn't believe it was possible. God wants to say to you today, is anything too hard for God? And if that's you, we want to invite you to come forward. We want to trust God to pray with you. You see, one of the beautiful things about church, not building, but people coming together, is the presence of God. And here we can receive the word of God and we can say, oh, that's great that we can leave. It changes us. Or we can engage with Him. And we can say, God, you are here and there's power to transform in a different way than just hearing it. A, the Bible calls it the laying on of hands, which is one of the basic principles of the Christian faith. There is something that happens, just like we did earlier in the service, where we pray with and we pray for one another. And if you need Jesus to stir faith in your heart, if you have a scroll that you need to give back to Him, if there's a little bit of a, a laugh in your heart thinking God can do this, we want to proclaim and prophesy over your spirit that there is one who is worthy. That is anything too hard for God. So I want to ask me, as we worship this song, I want to ask if that's you, while we're worshiping, you're welcome just to step forward. Just There's plenty of space here for ministry. We want to pray with you. We want to trust God that He would come and He would take that scroll that he would stir hope and faith, he would open your eyes, that like John, you would see the Lamb. And hope and joy would stir in your heart around that. And so, Father, I want to thank you for every single person here today. Lord. I thank you, Jesus, that I know you have scrolls, not a scroll, scrolls written over all of our lives, that, Father, you have prepared good works beforehand that we must walk in them, God. You have prepared relationships and people that we get to walk with, Lord. You have set us within families, Lord. You have spoken love and truth and grace over us. And right now, Jesus, we want to ask that you would take those scrolls from the Father because you are worthy. Surely, Lord, nothing is impossible for you. Lord, even all of the faith that stirs in our hearts, all of the hope, all of that, God, for just a moment, we want to step away from the outcome and we want to look to you, Jesus, as our author and the finisher of our faith, God. The Holy One of heaven. Amen. As we worship, if you need prayer.